Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the preview event for this year's Ephemera Society of America's conference, Creating Places and Spaces. I'm David Lilburn, the current president of the ESA. The ESA, Ephemera Society of America, is a not-for-profit organization formed 42 years ago. Our members are collectors, curators, institutions, researchers, and dealers. Our mission is to cultivate and encourage interest in ephemera and its history. The ESA serves as an umbrella organization for those collectors, dealers, institutions, scholars. Our website, ephemerasociety.org, all one word, ephemerasociety.org, offers full information about the society and about ephemera in general, as well as containing many online exhibits and blogs. Thanks to the hard work of our uh, past president, Dick Sheaf, our website is very rich with visual content. So I encourage everyone to go out and take a look and spend a lot of time out there. Today, we'll be enjoying two excellent presentations, one located on the East Coast, one on the West Coast, one about indoors, one about outdoors. Very balanced. Our first presenter will be Andrew Alpin, the New York City trained architect who comes with his own publicity campaign. An article in the New York Magazine on him, his apartment in which he has lived since 1962. If anyone needs a link to that article, please uh, uh, put a request in. We'll make sure you can't find it. We'll be happy to send it to you. Um, as an introduction, Andrew is a true ephemerist who has used ephemera to write six books, all on New York City apartments, including the one he's going to focus on today, the Dakota. You'll be fascinated, but unless you take copious notes, you're going to have to go back to our website to watch the rebroadcast so you can catch all that information that he's going to impart. Our second presenter is Gary Kurtz, a trained librarian who started work at the Huntington in 1970 and is now retired from being principal librarian for California history and special collections at the State Library in Sacramento. Gary has written several books and scores of articles. Most recently, the Book Club of California published his The Kondike and Alaska Gold Rush, a descriptive bibliography of books and pamphlets. We, we particularly like the pamphlets bit. Uh, Gary is presenting on R.B. Woodward and his Hotel and Gardens in early San Francisco. Before we get into the uh, presentations, so a couple of points. One, please do consider going to ephemerasociety.org, clicking on the support button to make a donation. Any contribution will be greatly appreciated. Two, later today, beginning at 4.30 Eastern Standard Time, so, uh, the society members only will be given early entry into this weekend's fine online virtual ephemera fair presented by Marvin Getman's Impact Events. And three, a couple of more technical points. If you wish to submit a, uh, a question to the presenters, please do so in the Q&A function and not the chat function. You'll see that there's two distinct areas in the Zoom. Uh, board member Mike Pike will be monitoring the incoming questions and will be presenting as many as he can get through uh, after the speech. So let's begin. Andrew Alpin, you have the floor. But we need, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I think I'm connected correctly now. All right, uh, let me see if I can share the screen and bring up my 
slides. There we are. Ah, my accumulation of ephemera was the catalyst for all of my 11 books, six of which uh, have been about apartment houses. Uh, there's a little story behind that. Uh, in 1973, my excitement at having discovered a descriptive brochure for a proposed new apartment building of 1910 that never got built prompted my father to suggest that I should write a book about apartment houses. He reasoned that I already knew a lot about them, having lived in one all my life and having visited my friends in their apartments. True enough, that brochure that I had gleefully shown to him that evening joined others of the same vintage that I had already acquired at flea markets and from ephemera dealers. But if I were going to write a book on the subject, I would need a much broader selection of examples. So I started collecting floor plans and descriptive brochures from the rental offices of new buildings, tracking ephemera down to their sources, as it were. Once I had amassed a respectable collection of material, I set my sights on a building a short walk from where I lived. The Dakota is a grand old apartment house, the first truly luxury apartment building in New York. And I dreamed of uncovering an original rental brochure for it. Eventually, I resigned myself to the reality that no such thing existed. But what I did find were postcards showing the building, current advertisements for apartments for sale in the building, and even a tissue box whose sides were covered with printed paper images of the building. A cover of the New Yorker magazine carried a charming watercolor image of the Dakota, as did the cover of a Christmas catalog from the venerable bookstore Brentano's, which had been founded in 1853, but sadly is now defunct. An 1889 issue of Frank Leslie's newspaper yielded a charmingly bucolic vision of the Dakota. While the geese and goats may have come from the artist's imagination, this opposing photograph shows that the blocks adjoining the building were indeed almost bucolic. Facing the camera is a charming little house complete with picket fence. Commercial ventures are also present. At the bottom of the photograph is a good sized building bearing a sign, carpenter shop. And near it is another building advertising window screens. On the corner of 71st Street is a building and adjoining outdoor space. The sign says that it is the Park Summer Garden with another sign on the roof advertising Eichler's Doppel Beer. I found two cast metal models of the building, which are certainly ephemeral and peripheral, and thus in my mind qualify as ephemera. The one on the right is part of a series called Buildings of Disaster 
by Konstantin Boim, uh, the Russian artist who made them. It commemorates the murder of John Lennon at the building's entrance in December of 1980. As I often walked past the Dakota, I was very aware of the splendid cast iron dragons and bearded men who protect the dry moat that in turn protects three sides of the building. So I was delighted to discover an advertisement in a builder's magazine of the period, which shows <clears throat> the showroom of the ironworks company that made those castings. One of them is featured right in the front of the photograph, proudly displayed in that long ago showroom. I hit the jackpot when I was able to acquire the original application to the Department of Buildings on which the superintendent had signed his approval of the construction design drawings on October 6, 1880, and where an inspector for the department had signed off the project's completion four years later on November 1st, 1884. Inside the application, the architect Henry Hardenberg described the thickness of the masonry walls supporting the building and the sizes of the beams carrying the floors. That application described a building very significantly larger than anything around it, with a separate adjoining underground structure housing its boilers. Thomas Edison's electric cables hadn't yet been extended to the Upper West Side, so dynamos were installed next to the boilers to create electricity for the building. This plan comes from a land book atlas, which shows each building on every block in the city with dimensions, heights, and much other information included. Sorry. Here, the Dakota was identified as an apartment hotel because of the private dining room and meal service that was provided for the residents from its opening in 1884 until the labor shortages of World War II forced its closure. My discovery of the original construction application got me working in earnest. So I visited the building and discovered atop an old cabinet and covered in dust original rental plans mounted on boards. When I examined the photographs I had made of them, I realized that many of the actual layouts were different from what those drawings showed. So I had new plans created of each floor, working from layouts of apartments there that real estate brokers had for sale and had posted onto their websites. The plan at the left is the rental plan for the sixth floor. Next to it is the plan I created by assembling individual plans of the sixth floor apartments. I looked for old photographs of the building and its surroundings and found an unusual view of its backside whose totally plain facade was so different from the three other elevations that I concluded that the developer, Edward Clark, intended to erect a second building, perhaps 25 feet or so from the first one, once that initial venture was complete and throwing off a cash flow. 
If that was his plan, it was thwarted by his death in 1882 in the middle of the project's construction. I also found several charming images of skaters on the Central Park Lake with the Dakota in the background. Of course, I continued to scout out the customary ephemera categories and acquired a lovely stereo card showing the building in its original loneliness, the only high rise building at the west side of Central Park and a fitting backdrop for many more of those skaters on its solidly frozen lake, something that global warming has precluded for many years now. Another stereo card shows the Hotel Majestic, newly completed across the street to the south, and the statue erected in Central Park to honor Daniel Webster. That image lingering in my mind led to my discovery of another photograph of that statue with an unfinished Dakota in the background. This one on a three by four inch glass lantern slide. Look closely at the ridge beams of the three peaked roofs and you will see bare wooden joists. And the truncated central pyramidal dormer is still incomplete. Lantern slides were something I had experienced as a child, as they were the best presentation technology of the 1940s, especially when paired with short movies on the same topic. Lantern slides projected once a week onto a large screen in my elementary school were used to teach us about art and architecture. Enhanced with the more modern technology of Photoshop, this lantern slide is apparently the earliest known image of the building and the only progress photo that was ever seen by any of the archives and researchers I have consulted. <clears throat> Almost as old is this image I found in London at the Royal Institute of British Architects. The librarian there explained that the Institute had dispatched a photographer to New York with his large wooden view camera and heavy glass plate films to take pictures of the latest modern American architecture here for the benefit of English architects on the other side of the big pond. This very early view shows how isolated the building was with the then ubiquitous telephone wires on tall wooden poles. Following the blizzard of 1888, those wires were gradually relocated underground. Central Park was effectively the front yard of the building. Look closely in front of the bush and you will see a man in a straw boater leaning on that rustic fence made from unfinished tree branches. The park's pleasures were enjoyed by young and old, guarded by mounted policemen. Along with fences such as the one in the prior photograph, the park originally had many vine-covered rustic wood shelters with benches. Two were included just inside the entrance to the park opposite the Dakota. Many of them were still in place when I started using the park as a little boy. 
but they gradually deteriorated and most of them were removed. The crisp reality of photographs in my mind needed the counterpoint of artists' views of the building. So I searched out two drawings uh, from one artist who lives just north of New York City. And I commissioned a charming watercolor ink drawing of the entrance from a delightful chap who lives in Sydney, Australia. A significant category of ephemera is magazine articles. Many of them have provided important material for all of my books, but especially so for the one about the Dakota. The Venerable Dakota was published in 1959 in the magazine Architectural Forum. As a young architect, I subscribed to that magazine and I saved the article. It shows the entrance with its gates fully open as it was a simpler time when security was a much less important issue and terrorism was unheard of in New York. And the article includes pictures of the original doors to the hydraulic elevators and the water tanks that were needed to run them. When conversion to electric operation was complete, those elements disappeared. The Great Dakota appeared in Look magazine in 1964. Look was a competitor to Life magazine and imitated its inclusion of far more photographs than text. Here, it included pictures of two theatrical couples in their Dakota apartments, Lauren Bacall with Jason Robards and Zachary Scott with Ruth Ford. In 1993, the Sunday Magazine section of the New York Times had an article titled The Nutcracker Suite, which featured the over-the-top apartment of dancer Rudolf Nureyev. This was his bedroom, occupying what had originally been the apartment's dining room. It's an eclectic mix of a canopied Jacobean English bed, an Italian Renaissance cassone piled high with antique textiles, and in the lower left-hand corner, a Venetian double manual harpsichord. Reflecting his Russian background, the apartment emulated the taste of the imperial czarist era and included huge paintings, hand-painted scenic wallpaper, and a massive chandelier of colored Murano glass. At the opposite end of the aesthetical scale was the rooftop duplex of designer Ward Bennett. To accentuate the soaring lines of the steep roof to his home, Bennett designed, <clears throat> designed the seating and table surfaces low on the floor. This clean-lined and sun-filled apartment appeared in an issue of House and Garden in 1965. To access his front door, you had to walk across a portion of the outdoor roof, and in winter, he had to shovel away the snow in order to go in or out. Down on the first floor of the building, was the apartment that Giora Novak had created 
in the baronial space of the Dakota's original communal dining room with the adjoining private dining room serving as his bedroom. The basement kitchen and pantry became his painting and sculpture studio. After Novak and his wife Judith moved out, their expansive apartment was bought by a very wealthy man with several children. He proposed to the, board's, the board of directors of the Dakota that he be permitted to construct bedrooms for his children in the basement, lighted by the building's dry moat, that air conditioning equipment be placed on the floor of that moat, and that the building's certificate of occupancy be changed to reflect those alterations to space use. The board refused his request. Long drawn out negotiations <clears throat> merely led to both sides becoming increasingly stubborn and antagonistic. Pugnaciously, the apartment owner brought a lawsuit against the building and against each member of the board individually. In the meantime, he continued to pay the large monthly maintenance on an apartment into which he had never moved. The lawsuit stretched out to 20 years, shades of Jarndyce versus Jarndyce, and at some point he stopped paying the maintenance. When the final appeal went against him, the apartment was sold to satisfy the building's lien for the unpaid maintenance and the owner got the remainder of the price that was realized on the sale. 20 years and a very large amount of money lost on both sides all because of the very large egos of the people involved and unrealistic fantasies. The expansive dreams of that would-be Dakota resident were as much a fantasy as the supposed story of how the building got its name. The newspaper ephemera that I collected from the time of its construction revealed no tale of its being so far out in the country that it ought to be called the Dakota. In fact, the first mention of that story came in a 1933 article uh, in the Herald Tribune and it was just an idle speculation by the long retired manager of the D Dakota. The reality is that the builder, Edward Clark, simply liked Western names. He had proposed renaming 8th, 9th, 10th, and 11th avenues for the territories of Montana, Wyoming, Arizona, and Idaho. And when his proposal was rejected, he contented himself with naming his new building for the Dakota Territory. He even had the head of a Dakota Indian carved in stone and mounted high on the south facade of the building. My accumulation of all of this relevant ephemera ultimately resulted in this monograph on the Dakota apartment house, which is currently in print. Also in print are two other books that grew from those same seeds of ephemeral printed paper. Posh Portals is my most recent book. It shows the entrances to many of the finest apartment houses in New York. 
The one called luxury apartment houses was printed in paperback in 1992 and continues to sell. The monograph of 2001 on the apartment buildings of Messrs. Candela and Carpenter describes the cream of New York luxury dwellings with floor plans gleaned from those brochures I started collecting decades earlier. Apartments for the Affluent was that first book that my father had suggested I write and which came out in 1975 with a drawing of the Dakota on the cover that I found in a newspaper of 1884. That book has been reprinted in paperback by Dover under the title, New York's Fabulous Luxury Apartments. I didn't choose that title. Finally, of ephemeral interest is a boxed collection of bits and pieces of the work of Edward Gorey that I produced and published more than 40 years ago. This is the title page. When I asked my friend, Mr. Gorey, what to call the little compilation, he wrote down on a piece of paper, the letters F period, M period, R period, A period. I looked at those letters and scratched my head, trying to turn the abbreviation into a title for the collection. When I finally gave up, he instructed me to say them out loud. F-M-R-A in print became ephemera when spoken. I had graduated from collecting ephemera to publishing it. Thank you. Well, Andrew, thank you for a fascinating, fascinating and very informative and enjoyable talk. Uh, you are a living representation of someone whose interest in ephemera has produced very interesting scholarship. Um, and I think I'm pretty safe in saying that you are the first speaker we have heard, or certainly that I have heard, in my year's association with the Ephemera Society of America, who uh, has moved from physical ephemera to the spoken word ephemera through Mr. Gorey's title page. I think, I think that's a, a, a fabulous, um, a fabulous uh, connection. Um, while we're on um, that, that subject of um, amusing and uh, interesting uh, ephemera, uh, we have a uh, question here or uh, a comment here from Nicholas Merchant who says he has known you for 40 years. Um, and he wonders if that means that you are now a part of his ephemera, um, or I'm sorry, that he is a part of your ephemera. Um, we've had, we have a number of questions, one of which is, uh, I think, a, a, a very interesting question. Um, and that is, are the current residents of the Dakota aware of and interested in the building's history. They are very, very aware of its history and very, very interested in the history and uh, in maintaining the very historical building that they live in. Um, uh, they are very, very protective of the building, um, very much more so after the unfortunate incident uh, that terminated Mr. Lennon's life. Um, from that point on, uh, every Beatle fan in the whole world um, uh, seemed to uh, feel that the Dakota was his personal property. And uh, those gates became closed 95% uh, of the time as a result. They also uh, have been very, very careful in restoring a building <clears throat> that's 135 years old 
uh, and um, uh, shows it uh, in all sorts of different ways uh, of breaking down systems and, and leaks and all of that. They recently completed a complete re-roofing of all of those roofs using slate from the same quarry in New Jersey that supplied the slate for the original building. They are that careful with it. Uh, they are a very impressive group of people. Well, um, I can certainly understand that, that uh, restorative component of it. Um, I live in um, uh, a historic area of Pennsylvania and all of the architecture in this area uh, is very carefully restored using original materials to the extent, of course, that they, that they can. I'm, I'm wondering too, here's another question. And this question has to do with the, um, the signature style of the Dakota. And by that, I don't mean the architectural style, but rather um, the way in which one encounters the Dakota. And I, I'm referring here to your book on posh portals. Did the Dakota have an influence on subsequent apartment houses that were designed in, in, uh, in Manhattan. And I think specifically of a friend of mine who has had an apartment in the Beresford, which is you know, right up the street from the Dakota more or less. Um, so does the, does the Dakota, had, did the Dakota have an influence on, on style, the style of uh, New York apartment buildings? Uh, absolutely, it did. Um, it was the first and uh, it was emulated. Um, uh, developers saw that it was very large. Uh, uh, initially, uh, they saw that uh, there was a very grand arched entrance to the Dakota, and you could drive your carriage uh, into uh, that entrance, into a central um, courtyard, and drive around the courtyard and come out again. And that was very, very impressive. It was a square donut uh, is essentially what the Dakota is. So uh, when um, uh, uh, William Waldorf Astor um, uh, built the Apthorpe at Broadway and 79th Street, not so terribly far away from the Dakota, um, that was also a square donut with an even grander uh, three-story high arch. Uh, and you could uh, uh, drive in, by that time you could drive an automobile in uh, and drive around. And then um, uh, a third developer uh, up at 86th Street and Broadway did the same thing on an even larger scale with the Bell Nord, um, a huge uh, square or rectangular uh, donut uh, with two arched entrances. By the time your friends um, building the Beresford was built in 1929, um, the need for a drive-in courtyard seemed to have receded. Um, and it also took up too much uh, real estate. And um, by the 1920s, the value of real estate in Manhattan had skyrocketed. Uh, so when Emery Roth designed uh, the Beresford, uh, he didn't put a huge arch uh, in, and he didn't put a a central courtyard, but he certainly did a very grandiose entrance. Uh, so the Beresford certainly qualifies as a posh portaled building. It does indeed. Uh, uh, I, I've never been inside the Dakota, but I suspect that it's rather like walking into the Beresford, which uh, I've, I've done on many occasions. Yes, well, the uh, aesthetic, of course, of eight, the 1880s uh, uh, inside your apartment was very different from 1929. If you walk into an apartment in uh, the Dakota, uh, one that has either been preserved or restored, 
you will get more the feeling that you get if you walked into a very large brownstone of the period. And that was very deliberate on the part of the architect and the developer in order to attract people from brownstones, um, uh, which had lots of problems uh, in that you had a staircase and you were constantly walking up and down because the, uh, your house was on uh, four or five different levels and you needed many, many servants uh, to support it. And what Mr. Clark was selling was, you can have the same thing in my new Dakota building all on one floor. So you don't have to keep walking up and down stairs and I, as the developer, will provide all the services that you formally needed an army of servants to provide. Well, that's a very interesting point because, uh, you know, it, it further shows, I think, the brilliance um, of the developer of Edward Clark because he, he, he wants to present something new but yet he wants it to be in a familiar form. So he emulates the brownstone, but as you just uh, very pointedly pointed out, uh, he does so in an entirely different, in an entirely different manner. I, I have always felt that Edward Clark was the Steve Jobs of the <laughs> 1880s. Uh, he started out um, uh, as a young lawyer um, uh, encountering a man named Isaac Merritt Singer, who had invented a sewing machine, except he had a patent problem. Um, uh, so Mr. Clark um, solved the patent problem for him, or helped to solve the patent problem. Uh, but uh, Singer didn't have the money to pay him. So Clark said, that's all right. Uh, give me part ownership of your uh, 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 sewing machine company. Uh, and he did. And Clark then took the sewing machine the same way that Jobs took the uh, portable telephone and created uh, a new product that created a need that nobody knew they had before and they all flocked and wanted to buy this new product, this sewing machine, exactly the same way uh, uh, that the phones were done. He then came, made lots and lots of money from it over the years and later in life uh, decided to um, uh, build uh, something new the same way that he had done with the sewing machine, a, a luxury apartment house. He created a need and a desire on the part of people uh, for this new concept, this new building type. He made it so desirable that everyone wanted in just the way Steve Jobs did. Well, you know, just as a quick follow up to that, the early computer boards had, uh, because people were used to typing on typewriters and hearing that click clack noise, um, early in, in computer board uh, uh, keyboards, you could still hear the click clack noise. Uh, I think there was some little chip in there. Um, to move to another, I think, interesting question. And that is, um, this follows up on what you said about the, the size of um, the apartments. And you know, we, we saw those wonderful representations you know, of the very clean lines of Ward Bennett to the over-the-top uh, Russian imperialist czarist style of Nureyev. Um, the question here is, uh, what, is the, what are the approximate sizes of the apartments in the Dakota, or do they all, are they different sizes all, all over the, the board? They, they are all over the board. Originally, uh, there were large apartments uh, um, exclusively except on the second floor. And the second floor had 
small units that you could uh, rent for your guests. Mm -hmm. uh, your mother-in-law came down from Canada and she's going to stay with you for three weeks. Um, uh, so you rent a little apartment for her. And um, uh, those have remained. The eighth floor uh, was um, uh, servant spaces and the ninth floor, more servant spaces and laundries. And those spaces, of course, uh, have been converted uh, primarily after the building uh, became a co-op in uh, 1964 um, or thereabouts. Um, uh, so those are smaller. And um, at the same time, there were some, uh, when it was co-op, there was a lot of trading people who had been renting a large apartment said, we can't afford and don't need this apartment. Um, uh, can we cut it into two? So they cut it into two and then uh, sold that way. So there have been many changes. People have uh, who needed another bedroom were able to tack on a bedroom from the adjoining apartment. There's a huge mix now. Uh, of different kinds of apartments. Yes, well, that, that's not surprising. Does the Dakota itself, one of our uh, guests asked, does the Dakota have a repository of ephemera? Um, I don't know. Um, they have been so secretive uh, that um, I had to do all of my research uh, relying on just a couple of friendships there and they were walking on eggshells. Oh. Um, the um, uh, board of directors is very, very leery of any uh, publicity at all um, because there are so many uh, residents who tend to create their own uh, publicity. Uh, Yoko Ono still lives in that building mm. um, and has uh, several apartments. Um, I spoke with her, uh, but only briefly. She very clearly uh, didn't want to talk to anyone uh, connected with writing. Mm. Um, and understandably, I think. Yeah. Um, another question, it, since you mentioned Yoko Ono and earlier you mentioned John Lennon, um, have you had any interest in the movies that were set at the Dakota? Uh, very specifically, lack of interest. Um, uh, when I started uh, talking about the Dakota to people, everyone would start talking about Rosemary's Baby. Uh, well, I got sick of that. Uh, for one thing, Rosemary's Baby, the uh, in interior uh, shots uh, were not shot at the Dakota. Uh, they created their own interiors uh, on uh, some stage somewhere. The only connection to the Dakota that um, actually uh, was real was they flew a helicopter around that took some shots um, as, as general location shots at the beginning of the movie. And that's the only connection there. And that sort of thing um, I, I put on the same level um, as uh, interviewing uh, Basil Rathbone, uh, <laughs> who lived there. Um, that's a, a sort of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Sensationalist uh, uh, appeal. And the Dakota uh, does not appeal to me at a sensationalist level. Uh, it's on a historical and an architectural level and an urbanistic level that I find it appealing. Well, good for you. Um, uh, another question having to do with your interest in your, not only your interest, but your collection. Um, are you still looking for and finding 
pieces of ephemera one of our viewers wants to know uh, uh, related uh, to the, the dakota uh, uh if all of a sudden i found some interesting um ephemera on the dakota i certainly would snap it up uh, but um several years ago uh, um, I donated to the Avery Architectural Library um, uh, my entire collection of apartment house brochures and floor plans. Uh, it was many boxes worth. And more recently, I have donated uh, 20 bankers boxes of research files to the New York Historical Society. So and, and somehow uh, there doesn't seem to have been a dent in my file folders. I'm still overwhelmed with paper. Well, you are you are, if I may say this, Andrew, um, uh, a devoted ephemerist. So, um, uh, to one other question, uh, someone asked, "Will a video of this chat be available later?" And yes, it will be available. Please consult the Ephemera Society of America's website. We've regrettably come to the end of uh, the time we've allotted for your uh, presentation, and I'll close with with two comments. Um, I, you know, the ultimate um, wonderful comment I think by anyone is that uh, this viewer said, um, "I shall look very closely the next time I walk past the Dakota." Thank you. And as one other uh, viewer said. Bravo in all caps and exclamation points. So to you, Andrew, bravo. And I too shall look more closely at the Dakota. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.